So my privilege to introduce our keynote speaker for the night, Mark Lukacs, who is the author of the international best-selling memoir, My Lovely Wife in the Psych Ward. And his work has been published in the New York Times, The Atlantic, Pacific Standard, Wired, and other publications. He's spoken about this on the Today Show and a number of media outlets and uh, talked to businesses, hospitals, schools, mental health organizations, and so on across the country. In addition to his work as a writer and public speaker, he is currently the ninth grade dean and a history teacher at the Athenian School in California, in the San Francisco area. He lives with his wife, Julia, and their two sons in the San Francisco Bay Area, as I said, and he first wrote about Julia and her bipolar diagnosis in a New York Times Modern Love column, and again in a piece for Pacific Standard, which was the magazine's most read article in 2015. And all of that to say really the bottom line is, uh, Mark comes from the heart, he has a perspective that I think is important for all of us to listen to about illness and uh, what he and his family, including his wife, Julia, have experienced on a chronic illness from the neck up as opposed to chronic illness from the neck down and how they're treated differently and what his experience has been around that. Uh, he's a marvelous man and a wonderful speaker. And ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Mark Lukacs. Uh, good evening, everybody. Awesome. It's, uh, it's really great to be in Nebraska. I drove through Nebraska once, like nine years ago. Um, and I don't know if this is a center point thing or a Nebraska thing, but any place that serves dinner and puts dessert at the ta on the table at the beginning, that is my kind of party. So I'm very happy to be here. Um, it's surreal to be here. I am a history teacher, right? Um, what happened to my family was sort of thrust on us and we've just kind of tried to move forward going from there. But it is so humbling to be here with Centerpoint because in Lincoln, Nebraska, you have cutting edge, leading edge, progressive mental health care. And I think that's really amazing how holistic it is, how inclusive it is, how family centered it is, and how most of all it's built on the concept of dignity. Um, I'm gonna just give you a preview. My, fam my wife and I, Ours is a story of privilege and access, and Centerpoint is on the front lines of peeping, working with people who are the most vulnerable, the uninsured, and yet for us, with our fancy Georgetown University degrees and our well-paying jobs and our work-provided insurance, we still barely made it through the mental health care system. And so I just really wanna say what, how amazing it is, the work that you all have here in this community. So, I actually heard about Julia, my wife, before I met her. Um, I had arrived to my dorm room at Georgetown, and I'd literally been in my room about an hour talking to my roommate, and he said, hey, have you heard about this Italian girl? And um, I said, no, but I like the sound of that, you know? And I, a few days later, we were at some like freshman mixer thing, and I, and I saw her, and I basically was like, okay, so this is the girl I'm going to have a crush on for the next four years. I'm never really going to have the courage to go and talk to her. So I decided instead that I was going to yell at her. Um, that was how I was going to get her attention. Because at the time, there was this movie out called Life is Beautiful, which maybe some of you might be familiar with. And the main character, he sort of catches the attention of his love interest by anytime he sees her, he says, buongiorno, principessa, which means good morning, princess. I'm already choked up thinking about her. And so I said, I'm going to do that. So like I'd be sitting in my dorm room, look out the window. There's Julia walking through the quad. I open the window. Buongiorno, principessa. And thankfully, she always smiled at me when I did it. So um, about a month later, we were at a party. I started talking to her. She started talking to me. I walked her to her dorm room. Conveniently, it was one floor below mine. I went in for a good night kiss and she met me there. And basically we were 18, we were one month into college. And I think already we were starting to identify as Mark and Julia. I think we already knew in some ways that we were gonna be together. So a year out of college, I proposed and shockingly she said yes, even though I looked like Jeff Spicoli at the time. 
uh, this glamorous Italian with this surf dude. And so we got married in the Catholic Church, and the Catholic Church prescribes vows for you to choose from. And I decided I was going to write Julie a letter, like to personalize it a little bit. And basically the gist of the letter said, um, you know, life has a lot of really dull, boring moments in it, like waiting in line at the bank. And my vow to you is to try to bring as much fun into life as I can, which is ridiculously naive. Because first off, who goes to the bank anymore? We have phones for that. But I think the bigger thing is that when I was 23 and about to get married, my concept of love and marriage was about fun and enjoyment. And I didn't know what love can actually demand of us, what it can ask us to do when the person you love is in pain. So the day after we got married, we packed up our stuff in a moving van and we moved out to California because we thought what's more romantic than the chase the sunset out to the West Coast. We didn't even have a, a place to go. We just told the moving van, drive to San Francisco and hopefully we'll have a place by the time you get there. And um, I found a teaching job, Julia, who is, she was like a 4.0 student from kindergarten on. And so she, of course, found a really fancy job very quickly. And we were basically living the California dream together. We lived right by the beach. I was surfing all the time. We were, you know, enjoying the culture of San Francisco. And then about three years into being married, Julia started a new job at a new company. And when she came home from work the first day, I asked her, I was so excited for her, Julia, how was that first day? And she, there was this pause before she responded. And now she exudes confidence about work. And I'd never seen this pause. She was like, you know, it was, it was good. Yeah, it was good. They're really smart there, but it was good. And I kind of see that pause as the seed of what eventually grew and very quickly grew into something much bigger and much scarier. So it started with a pause, and then it became kind of getting stuck at work. Like she'd sit down to write an email and wouldn't know what to say. And then I might get a, a whispered call. Hey, Mark, can you, can you read this email? I've been working on it for a few hours. I want to make sure it sounds just right. Yeah, of course, send it to me. And it would be like a one-sentence nothing email to her boss that she had spent hours fixating on. And then at home, she, she lost her appetite. She just kind of sit there and poke at her food. And then it eventually became an inability to fall asleep. Restlessness, tossing and turning. And we would try like, you know, meditation and scented candles and all these other things. And eventually I would drift off to sleep because I was tired too. And as I fell asleep, I was so, I felt so guilty because I didn't know, is she gonna sleep tonight or not? And one morning, about six weeks after she started the job, I woke up and Julia was just sitting upright on the edge of the bed. And she said, Mark, I talked to God last night. Now, we need to understand about Julia. We were both raised Catholic, but she's not especially connected to her Catholicism. For her, so for her to say she talked to God was out of character, to say the least. So she says, I talked to God last night. And I was like, OK, what did God say? She said, don't worry about it. It's going to be okay. You're going to be okay, Julia. So I was worried, but I was at least reassured that she, this message she was getting felt good. But then a few days later, I woke up, and there she was frantically pacing around the room. And she said, I talked to the devil last night. The devil said, I'm not worth it. Like, I need to go. I'm bringing everybody down. And the only way for things to get better in this world is if I'm not in it. And so I panicked and I took her to the emergency room and I, I literally had to wrap her in my arms and carry her into our car. And she was like grabbing onto door jams to stay. And as we were driving through San Francisco, there's this big park called Golden Gate Park and we were sort of winding through it and around a bend, Julia popped off her seatbelt and opened the door. And I just pulled over and had to hug her to her seat and say, please, honey, let's just get to the hospital. Please stay in the car. So I got her to the emergency room and they 
began to process her and they're saying all these words that I don't know, like she's psychotic. And I'm like, what? Like, do you think she's dangerous? What does that even mean? And they amped her up on medication. They, they said, she's going to need to go to an inpatient clinic. Like she's, a da- she's dangerous, you know? And that was when this fairy tale that we had, this chasing the sunset into California, when it flipped upside down. And it all of a sudden started to feel like we were in some sort of dystopia. So in California, the law is that if someone enters a emergency room and is deemed safe to them, unsafe to themselves or others, they're put under what's called a 5150. And that basically initiates an involuntary three-day hold where a person is placed under observation in a psychiatric hospital. And they're offered medication, but they're not required to take it. And so Julia was 5150 would We were 27 years old. My parents were living in Tokyo, Japan. Her parents were living in Rome, Italy. We were on the other side of the world from our family. And I was sitting there in the emergency room thinking, what happens now? Where where do I go next? And so actually, I went to the hospital because I was afraid that after this 5150 expired, are they just going to let her loose? They're going to offer her meds but not make her take them? So I actually wanted to go to the hearing to advocate that Julia would have to extend her 5150 to be put on what's called a 5250. That's a 14-day hold. And I think more importantly, that's a hold in which a patient cannot refuse medication. So if they don't take pills willingly, what it means is that people stronger than them come into their room and hold them down and inject them with medicine, even if they don't want it. And I wanted that to happen to her because I was scared of what would happen if she came home. And that was where I was first struck in the face by what it means to love someone who's in pain. That sometimes you have to make a choice between a horrible thing and a horrible thing, right? And that was just the first of many, many situations that we were put in as a couple where we had to confront what it's like to have something this big in your relationship. She was held for 23 days and she was deemed acutely psychotic. She was delusional. She was afraid for me to go in the room like I might catch what she had. She thought she was on a TV show when everyone was actors. She thought that I orchestrated the whole thing. Then she thought I was going to save the whole thing. And it was just, it just never felt like it was going to end. But they pumped her with a lot of antipsychotic medication. And eventually, she was able to sort of slow those delusions down. And after 23 days, they sent her home. And then my caregiving experience went from 90 minutes of visiting hours to 24 hours of this person being home with me and my responsibility to keep her safe. And while the psychosis had faded on the antipsychotics, unfortunately, an intense depression took its place. And Julia almost exclusively wanted to talk about suicide with me. It's one of the few things she would talk about. She'd say, you know, I don't like these pills that I have to take, but at least I know that if I take them all, then I can die. So I had to hide the pills. We went into this horrible routine where every night I would walk her into our bedroom, close the door, and then I would go and shuffle through the house for about 10 or 15 minutes and pretend to be looking for them because I had hid them somewhere. And then I would take them out of their hiding place, get out the right dose, continue so that she couldn't hear where in the house I had hid them. And every few days I would have to mix up the hiding place so I didn't have to worry about her trying to overdose. And then after a little while, she decided, nah, she didn't want to overdose. She was more interested in the Golden Gate Bridge, you know, which bizarrely is like a global landmark for suicide. People go from across the world to jump off the Golden Gate Bridge. I can say with tremendous pride that there is finally a barrier being built under that bridge so that people can't jump off it. But ever since it was first installed in the 30s, you could just hop over the rail, which is about this high, and just jump into the Pacific Ocean. 
And that's what Julia wanted to do. And one day, I came home from work. I took about three months off of work as provided for the federal, from the uh, Family Medical Leave Act in California, but then I did have to go back to work because I needed to keep insurance in order to pay for the care she was getting. And one day I came home from work and Julia, she just looked at me and she said, Mark, I, ha I can't decide what I'm going to do with the keys to the Vespa. Now what you have to understand is we had a Vespa for scooting around the city, right? And I was like, what are you talking about, the keys to the Vespa? She's like, so I'll take the Vespa to the bridge. And when I park the Vespa and when I walk and jump off, I don't know what to do with the key. I mean, we only have one key. And if I bring it with me, they might not find my body and then you lose the Vespa. But if I leave the key on the Vespa, someone might steal it and you still might lose the Vespa. And I'm like, you don't know what to do with the key? That's how much you've thought this out? And I'll tell you, at that moment, I didn't know what to say. I was truly at a loss for words. And I had spent so much time and energy acting like a fire hose that anytime she said anything that sounded suicidal, I was like, nope, we're not going there. Everything's fine, Julia. Look, at, we have this beautiful future to look forward to. You're going to get better. It's going to be all right. I love you. Your family loves you. It's going to be all good. And so she would just kind of sit there and shut up about it because I was the fire to put out. I was the fire extinguisher to put out the suicidal fire. Well, then when she brought up the Vespa key, I didn't know what to say. And for the first time, I said nothing. And so then she, began, she started speaking more about what she was afraid of and what the hospital had been like. And again, I said nothing. And I just sat there in the room with her. And she wanted to end her life in that moment, but I also knew she had no way to end her life in that moment. And so for the first time, I let her speak her pain. And I took it in. I didn't shut it up. And after that moment, she said, she said to me, I feel so much better. Thank you for listening to me. And I've learned through that how important it is to listen to people who are in pain. And I'm so impressed how much that seems central to what Centerpoint is doing. How many people I've talked to who have said, we have our recommendations, but we need to hear what the person wants and needs, you know? I think that's a really beautiful thing about what's going on here at Center Point. So to keep the story going, Julia was hospitalized for 23 days. She was in an outpatient program, acutely suicidal for nine months after that. And then with the right tweaks of medicine, changing this, increasing this amount, getting this out, it was gone. It vanished like in the matter of two days. It was unbelievable. It felt like a miracle. And Julie and I then had to do the hard work to try to say, okay, we'd had this year, and now I guess we just try to go back to living together, right? Even though for a year, I was every night hiding pills and making her take them. Even though for a year, I was planning what we were going to do and what she was going to do all day long. And now we were supposed to go back to being equals as husband and wife. And I, we, we really, really struggle with that. And if anyone in this room, and I'm guessing there's plenty of you who have been in a caregiving dynamic at some point, you can relate that caregiving is a power imbalance. And it's a, it's a, it's a matter of survival. That power imbalance is placed so that people don't get hurt. But once you're through that, Restoring the power is really, really difficult to accomplish. And Julie and I fought like cats and dogs. And what was really tragic is that even though we had made it through this horrible year, we, I think, felt like we were the closest to our marriage falling apart, to us not actually surviving. Even though she had survived the depression and the suicidality, now in normal times, we were afraid we weren't going to make it. But we kind of, that was in the background. And meanwhile, we just thought, let's keep living our life. So we said, we've always wanted to have children. Let's try to have a baby. Maybe that'll let us remember that life is good and we can get through this together again. 
And so Julia got pregnant. The pregnancy was super smooth. It was under the su supervision of her psychiatrist. Everything was great. We had our son Jonas. The birth was smooth, no problems. She was uh, on maternity leave for five weeks. I'm sorry, for five months. And then when Jonas was five months old and Julia went back to work, two weeks later, she was back in the psychiatric hospital with her second psychotic break. And I remember the arrogance I had going to the ER. I was like, yo, I got this. That, like, I've been here, you know? We know how to do this. Felt like putting on a familiar jacket, you know? And the doctor pulled me out in the hallway and she says, you have no idea what you're doing. Because yes, you took care of your wife once, but now you have a baby in the picture. This is a completely different ball game. Episode two for Julia lasted 33 days in the hospital. And for 33 days, I would try to schedule someone who would watch Jonas so I could go visit her or trying to convince Julia on the phone that maybe she should see Jonas and could I bring him down there with her? And she wasn't usually up for it. And by the way, 33 days of doing a drive that took about an hour and 15 minutes in one direction to go visit her in the hospital, right? And I'll be honest with you, it was during episode two that I think I felt the most hopeless. And it was in episode two that I realized I have to take care of myself better. I went about three days after Julia being hospitalized without eating anything. I just forgot. I was just so consumed. And so then finally on the way home, I stopped by a place called In-N-Out Burger, which maybe you've heard of. <laughs> It's not fast food, it's magic food. And so I went into In-N-Out and I, I'm not kidding, I had five hamburgers and two milkshakes. It was my first meal in three days and of course I felt horrible afterwards. But I realized like I, if, I have to, if I'm gonna try to be the man I need to be for both my wife and my child, I have to be firing on all cylinders. I need to be getting my sleep. I need to be speaking to a therapist. I need to be eating right. I need to be getting my exercise. And it's so strange because that felt so selfish because there was these two people who needed me. But if I wasn't needing, if I wasn't giving myself the space that I needed, then I was eventually gonna run out of energy for them too. A good friend of mine gave me the great analogy to the, uh, the masks that come down in the plane. You know, they always say, if the masks pop down, put your mask on first before helping children. And I always was like, what horrible parent would not help their child first? But now I realize if you don't put your mask on first, you might pass out. And all of a sudden you need help and you can't help anyone when you're passed out, you know? So what I ended up turning to as a huge place of relief for me was writing. It was a really unexpected thing to do. It started with emails to my parents and to her parents who were desperate to be kept in the loop. So I'd put her to bed. Julia was often asleep by seven o'clock at night under this heavy medication. And with the baby asleep and, and Julia asleep, I would just start writing. And that kind of helped me make sense of my day. And I realized, because I'm a history teacher and I was trying to do research on what was going on, that there are very few people who talk about the caregiving challenges. And so a friend of mine, a surf buddy of mine, who's actually a writer, who I used to confide in and what was going on, he said, hey, there's clearly a need for this story to be shared because no one's sharing it. So would you potentially consider writing about it? And here I was writing anyway. And I just kept writing the emails. I kind of thought about it. And then eventually Julie and I came to the decision together after her second episode when she was healthy that yeah, we did want to write about this. We did want to share this. And so as um, Topher said in my bio, I pitched an essay to the New York Times and they accepted it. And here I am, a high school teacher with now an essay in the New York Times and literary agents calling my door, uh, calling me. I had this awesome email from a literary agent who I Googled immediately, right? And I was like, oh my God, this is the agent for the woman who wrote the Twilight books. Like, I'm gonna call this woman. <laughs> so I called her and she says, I'm, I'm not kidding. The first thing she says, I'm sure you've Googled me already. <laughs> And I was like, don't be ridiculous. Who does that? You know, but I was seeing, I was like, oh my God, like this is crazy. Um, people want to hear our story. And I didn't go with the literary, the, the Twilight Lady, by the way. Um, I ended up connecting with this amazing agent who lives close to me in California. And we were able to work together to get uh, our book published. And I've left this image up for so long because that is also the cover 
of the book. So the book, it, it's, it's about mental illness, but honestly, at its core, it's about what it means to love someone and what it means that love, what it demands, what love demands of us to do, right? The pain that it can put us through and the sacrifices we have to make. And Julia, unfortunately, did have a third hospitalization when Jonas was two and a half. And the difference between episodes two and three were significant because what Julie and I realized after episode two was that this was not going away for her. Like after episode one, we were kind of like, what was that? That was awful, but that's done with. Let's go back to the good life, you know? But after episode two, it was like, no, nope, this is not over. This is in fact part of our reality now. And we need to adjust how we are as a family in order to make it that if this does come back, it doesn't destroy us because we have each other, we have our child, right? And so we actually, after she had completely cleared her second episode, we kind of constructed a plan of what we would do if another episode arose. Like for example, when Jonas was five months old, I kept wanting to bring him to the hospital and Julia was like, I really don't want him to bring him to the hospital. And I was like, that's just the delusion speaking. A mom should be with her baby. A baby should be with his mom. Like, let's go, you know? And but when Julia was healthy and not delusional, I asked her, if you have another episode, do you want me to bring Jonas to the hospital? And she said, absolutely not. I never want him to see me in a hospital like that. And so when episode three happened and she was psychotic and she would call me 15 times a day and say, Mark, bring Jonas, bring Jonas, bring Jonas. I was able to say to her, no, because you don't want him there and you know that. And just imagine if I didn't know that. Imagine instead if I had to say to my wife, you don't get to see your baby even though you want to, right? And the only reason we were able to avoid that is because, because we came up with a plan for how to let this be part of our lives. We had to figure out what to do with our parents. This is another part of our fortunate upbringing. Both of our parents, both of our sets of parents, as soon as Julia gets sick, they want to drop everything and like move in, you know? And like my in-law, I've got an Italian mother-in-law. Like when she comes and visits, I kid you not, she irons my socks, okay? <laughs> which is like cool and all, but definitely a little weird. And so I'm like, thank you for the help, but I maybe kind of need a little bit of space from you because you're processing something that's happening to your daughter in a very different way than I'm processing something that happens to my wife. And so we need to, Julie and I needed to be a united team around the idea that we um, would say, thank you for the offers of help. We're so fortunate to have you here, but we need to do this as ourselves. We need some space from you all. And so, although she's been hospitalized three times, the third hospitalization was five years ago at this point. And I honestly think the reason we get to have this beautiful photo up here of our two children is because we have learned to listen to each other's pain. I had to listen to what it actually feels like to be in the hospital. Sorry, if we can skip ahead one. Thank you. All right. Similarly, she had to listen to what it felt like to be a caregiver. She had to hear how exhausted I was, how afraid I was, how hurt I was, how angry I was, right? Not that it was her fault, but that doesn't mean I didn't feel angry. And so 19 months ago, our second little boy Cosimo was born. And here we are, Julius went through her second delivery smoothly and with no postpartum relapse. And we feel so fortunate that because we've gone through the, the, you know, the pits of figuring this out, it now feels like we can live as a family with bipolar and we don't fear what bipolar might do to us. Julia, in fact, actually says, she's like, I'm not scared of the, the hospital again. Like if I have to go back there, that's okay. I'm not worried. And I think that's incredible, you know? So I wanna close with three takeaways and then a final little thought. Um, sorry, for some reason this just isn't working. That's fine. Like as a teacher, I want to have my little bullet point, make sure you got the main message, right? You know? All right, class, did you take these notes about this? The first one is I want to really stress the importance of active listening and again, celebrate how much it sounds like that's happening here at Centerpoint. 
You know, I truly believe that there's no greater gift that you can give someone who is hurting than to be with them and to be present and to listen to them, not try to fix them necessarily, right? Some of you might be like me, you're problem solvers. Problem comes up, it's like, what's my, what are my eight steps to get rid of this problem? Okay, that doesn't help. <laughs> that did not help Julia. Julia needed to just be heard. The second takeaway is that I think that if you have a chronic illness in your family, it's important to have a plan for what it looks like when that illness is so demanding so that you can honor the autonomy of each other. I know which medications Julia does not want to take. And when she's psychotic, the doctors say, it's just because she's psychotic, we're going to get her better. And I can say, no, she does not want this pill. So let's find something else. And then the third takeaway is how important it is for caregivers to take care of themselves, to avoid being isolated. You know, how many weeks on end I went without talking to people besides a suicidal wife? How many phone calls I did not return? You know, and how much I needed a community to be there for me. Um, we have a family saying, Julie and I came up with it in the first episode. It's, we're all in this together. This is what I say to my children when I put them to sleep. This is what I say anytime I sign someone's book, I write it. And I think it's such a potent message of hope for how to navigate, how to make it through pain. We're all in this together. I think Centerpoint's living it. I think you all, by being here and supporting it, are living it. And so I'm going to close by saying to you all, thank you, and we're all in this together. Thank you. Thank you for being so vulnerable and passionate and uh, a spokesperson, but really in love with Julia. I mean, that was so evident and your commitment is gigantic. And the voice you give to uh, how many people in the room uh, have experienced this and the kind of thought and courage that you can lend to this by hearing words like this on finding your path through that when chronic illness hits that really threatens uh, the paradigm, the, the picture that you have set up, um, that's giant. And so thank you.